you've noticed. And also my foot is asleep. Oh, you know what that means. It's gonna keep you up all night.
Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Sue Lanyon. I'm the senior deacon here. Um, I'm just here to welcome you. So welcome, everyone. So wonderful to see you. Um, I've got a few announcements. The biggest announcement would be next Sunday is our church family picnic. So please come. It's lots of fun. Uh, Denise Ward is in charge. She's organizing all kinds of games and activities. So please join us. Ask your friends, family. Uh, it'll be enjoyable, I can guarantee, and delicious as well. Um, also, June 6th, uh, we have a MOPS meeting. I believe it's at 6.30. Is that Oh, it's in July. Okay. We have plenty of time for that then. Oh, July 6th. Okay. So July 6th. We have plenty of time for that. So July 6th will be our MOPS meeting, and we have a few other meetings coming up next week. But our biggest announcement is our um, picnic next week. Also, we do have um, evaluations. Today is the last day for Reverend Andy. Andy's not here today. We're very fortunate to have Reverend Fisk with us this morning. But if you have not given the deacons um, an evaluation yet, you're all invited to. Um, there's some in the back um, in the narthex, and I have some as well. You can just mail them to me. I've got some envelopes. You can mail them to me. Andy would love to hear from you. So if you can do that, uh, and every, as long as I receive them this week, that'll be fine. So thank you for that as well, all, the, all of you that have already done that. Um, I'd like you to relax and enjoy the introit as we gather from Judy and the choir. So lovely. Thank you. Um, I'd like to join you to join me on the uh, call to worship. It's in the front of your first page of your bulletin. From the time you fashioned the heavens and the earth from the formless, O oh God, your creative power has done marvelous works all around us. May your creative spirit be at work in our hearts and minds today. As we worship you and always, as we strive to live, as you have called us a little lower than the angels. I'd like you to stand up and join us for our opening hymn, God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale, on page 32.
I'd like you to join me as well of the unison prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer, also written on the first page of your program. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the sharing of the bread that we break and the cup that we drink may be for us your presence and give us loving fire and true vision to rejoice in our appointed place at your table as we pray together the prayer you have taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do we have any youngsters with us this morning? No? Okay. So let us um, come to our time of prayer. But first of all, I'd like to ask you if you have some joys or some uh, petitions, prayers that you'd like to uh, ask for us to include. Yes. So that's for Alex, a surgery on Tuesday. Thank you. Any, anything else? Any prayers of thanksgiving? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you up there. <laughs> Audrey. You're going for... Procedure, okay. Yes. Oh, wonderful. And what's her name? Sorry? Beverly. Beverly. Oh, hello, Beverly. Good morning. Wonderful, good news. Yes. Uh huh. Oh dear. That's Abel. Abel. Okay. Yes. That's for Jay. Jay Mello. Jay Mello. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yes, another one. Oh, thankful to be here, yes. Anybody thankful for the 45 degree temperature last night? <laughs> so my, my tomatoes and peppers are having a hard time. I guess I shouldn't, well, even if you'd waited till Memorial Day, it still would have been a problem. I'd never seen such cold night temperatures in June. Yes. Oh my goodness. So Uh-huh. So what's his name? Trevor. Trevor. Oh, 
say a prayer for my daughter, Laura, too, who um, had to go to the emergency room on Thursday night, but I guess everything's okay, so that's good. So, let us um, continue before the Lord in prayer on this uh, Sunday in the season of Pentecost, the um, Sunday of the Trinity. Gracious God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who is our abiding friend who helps us to grow in love. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth. So for all untruthful thoughts, words, and deeds, we ask your forgiveness. Forgive us for the times we've had a short fuse and have said and done things we regretted. Make us good listeners and light up a spirit of joy within us. We pray for joy, for joy comes as we turn the attention away from ourselves and attend to others. May we find joy in the smiles of children, in the kindness, kindnesses we can do for those who need help, in the celebration of others' victories, big and small, in the good and compassion of our neighbors, in the sharing of gifts and talents. So we lift up to you all these people and situations that have been named just now. We are thankful that we are here this morning and uh, we're thankful for your presence with us. And we're thank that, thankful that Beverly is back with us. We pray for all those who, have, who face um, medical procedures uh, for Audrey on Tuesday. We ask healing prayers for Alex, who is having surgery on Tuesday. For Abel, who's in the hospital. Uh, for Jay, facing a kidney transplant. And for my daughter, Laura. We pray for them, O oh God, for recovery of health, for healing, and for uh, the mercy of kindness and um, caring from those around them. We thank you too for little Trevor who had the fall but is okay. So where there is sickness and suffering, we pray for healing and comfort. Where there is discord, let there be harmony. Help us to trust your love. May we know that your strength is made perfect in our weakness that your love shines through our limitations. We pray for our nation, this beloved land and people. May we be united in the pursuit of peace and the well-being of all people. May we show a face of compassion to the world's needy. We pray for the world, for peace and justice for all people. We pray for the peacemakers and those who work to alleviate famine and the desperate situations of refugees. We pray for the earth, our home, which you have entrusted to our care. We pray for Pastor Andy as he takes the weekend to be away. We pray for the con congregation here to move forward under your guidance and to further your mission to be the light and salt of this community. In a moment of quiet, we bring our own other concerns to God. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen.
Hymn number 45, there's a wideness in God's mercy. I'll share with you our first uh, Hebrew scripture reading from Genesis chapter 1. When God began to, began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God said that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind, bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons 
and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and it was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening And there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. On the sixth day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made, the earth and the heavens. And our psalm reading is uh, Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the path of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Amen. 
you'll have noticed that the newer translation of Psalm 8 has the wording, yet you've made them a little lower than God. The older version says a little lower than the angels. So you can, I think it can mean either. You can take your pick. One of my favorite poets, John Betjeman, an English poet, he wrote this ditty about two people who were in love uh, sitting in a tea shop in England. Let us not speak for the love we bear one another. Let us hold hands and look, the man said. She, such an ordinary little woman, and he, such a thumping crook, but both for a moment just a little lower than the angels in the tea shop ingle nook. Both a little lower than the angels. Isn't that the story of humankind? We're a mix of sinners and saints, sometimes loving, sometimes selfish. Goodness and wickedness all roll together, order and chaos all together. Yet in God's creative mind, we are a glorious creation. God created us and pronounced us very good, says Genesis 1. A little lower than the angels, or a little lower than God even. In Genesis 1, the account of humankind is so much more positive than most of the news media that you hear every day, which tends to focus on human depravity. There's no denying that you can, humans can do a lot of harm. But, and that's part of the story, and that part of the story is told in Genesis chapter 2, where Adam and Eve uh, don't do what they're told to do. But the challenge for us is to stay positive as God does and see life through the eyes of Genesis chapter 1. God created out of the chaos, out of the formless void, says Genesis 1-2. The possibility of chaos and emptiness has existed since the beginning. In a very real way, the process of creation is an ongoing one. God creating out of the chaos of our everyday lives. Thus, this is the paradox of being human, a little lower than the angels, but threatened by chaos and negativity. Now, Genesis 1 was written by a priest during the time when the Israelites were held captive in Babylon, around the years 580 to 540. The writer makes use of the creation stories found in other religions of his day, but he stamps them with a distinctive faith of Israel. In Babylon, 1,000 miles east of Jerusalem, that's present-day Iraq, the Israelites were held as slaves, aliens in a foreign land, exiles from their homeland. So Genesis 1 was written to encourage them, to encourage their faith in God who is the creator and renewer of all. They don't need to fear the chaos that's all around them in Babylon. Their God creates out of chaos. They need not despair. God is in charge. God makes order, beauty, and truth. And humans are the pinnacle of God's work, made in the image of God, no less. And it's all very good. The Israelites are pressed on every side to give allegiance to the gods of Babylon. But Genesis 1 tells them there is only one God to give one's loyalty to. And this God can be trusted in the face of chaos, in the face of abandonment. We Christians and Christian churches are in spiritual exile in our own land. There are so many gods which would claim our allegiance and crowd out Jesus from our lives. Every ism can become a God from capitalism to materialism, militarism, even patriotism and nationalism when they blind us to the faults of our nation. Every addiction is a form of idolatry where we put something other than God at the center of our lives. The solution, as Alcoholics Anonymous teaches us, is to acknowledge that we cannot go it alone and we need our higher power at the center. We need Jesus at the center. 
One of the chief characteristics of mental illness is the presence of chaos. The person who struggles with a mental illness is struggling to overcome chaos. Movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Girl Interrupted, and A Beautiful Mind portray this struggle with chaos very well. It's a scary thing, as I personally know, being one who spent time in a mental hospital for depression when I was young. It's easy to fall into despair because the powers of chaos seem so strong. But I learned that God and Jesus are stronger and they create order, beauty, truth, and love out of chaos. In fact, the chaos becomes an opportunity for a new creation to take place. I've met folks throughout the years of my ministry who have had to deal with the emotional chaos of the loss of parents. These may be children whose parents have died and there are children who've been deserted by their parents in one way or another. Perhaps these children were abused or the parents may have been physically present but so wrapped up in themselves that they weren't emotionally present to their children. So children feel abandoned. All these children as they grow to adulthood have a common struggle against the feelings of abandonment. They feel that they've been thrown into the chaos without basic parental love to stabilize them. The challenge for such people is to seek and find the parental love of God. God as our father and our mother that comes to them through their their own friends and for those who mentor them and those who care for them then they internalize that love and become a good parent to themselves, the parent that was absent in earlier life. It can be done, and to a certain extent, everyone has to do it because there are no perfect human parents. Many parents cannot give the unconditional love that we crave. Only God can do that. One way or another, God seeks us out with healing love. This deep, deep love discovers us. We begin to love ourselves as God loves us. We are a little lower than the angels or a little lower than God even. And Jesus reminds us that since God loves us and we love ourselves, we ought also to love our neighbor. This means treating others with the way we want to be treated, with respect and goodness, no matter how much we don't like them. In 2014, the chief police, the police chief in Gloucester, Massachusetts, prepared, proposed a radical idea to invite drug addicts into the police station, not to arrest them, but to get them into treatment. In the first year, more than 420 walked into the station asking for help, and the police department, department got them into treatment programs, and it cost about 25% of the cost of arresting them and putting them in jail. There were 11 fatal heroin heroin overdoses in 2014, but after the program began, there was only one in 2015. It's a program that works. The idea of helping instead of punishing addicts has caught fire, and many police departments are doing it. The Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Network is over 700 public safety departments around the country now adopt these principles. Together they have referred thousands of people to treatment rather than to jail and saved many lives from uh, overdoses too. This is a radical idea because it's going back to the Genesis 1 idea that human beings are created in the likeness of God, a little lower than the angels. Human beings are not scum who cannot be saved just because they have an addiction. Each one is precious and capable of love and goodness if treated with love and goodness. But if you want to turn them into a permanent criminal class, lock people up in jails. That's the best school for criminals that ever there was. Too many people think too little of themselves. They treat themselves with harshness, and without forgiveness. But the way we treat ourselves is often the way we treat others. I am God's child. I am the apple of God's eye. 
God loves me and I love myself. And so I love my neighbor as myself. You can see how Jesus was a revolutionary because he taught these things in a society that thought God was all about punishment, not mercy. Indeed, we were made a little lower than the angels, a little lower than God. That's where we are in God's order of things. That's how God sees it. Is that the way you and I see it? The Benedictine monk John Maine is one of my spiritual guides in the practice of meditation and prayer. He took an ancient theme of the Christian mystics about the love that flows between the Trinity. Love is always flowing between the members of the Trinity. If you think of from the Father to Christ to the Spirit, and then he, he says that as John, uh, Jesus prayed for us in John 17, that we would be caught up into that flow of love, that we might become one with that God. There's a wonderful thought, another way of expressing our at-homeness in God, where we may get lost in wonder, love, and praise. So for a moment as we conclude this sermon, just relax and be quiet. Feel yourself carried along by that flow of love from our heavenly parent, from the Spirit and from Jesus, our friend and Savior. Just relax in that love. Be at home there and know that you are created in the image of God just a little lower than the angels, a little lower than God. We thank you, O God, that we are so privileged through the work of Jesus on the cross and through his resurrection that we are restored into the family of God, that we can become one with you. Know your love flowing through us to other people. So may this be so, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, communion hymn is Feed Us Now, number 519.
Jesus said, whoops, can you hear me all right? Okay. Jesus said, listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. And the psalmist tells us, taste and see that God is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. So this, this meal is prepared for, before for us. And uh, I don't know if I can manage this thing. Thank you. 
speak, speaks to us so powerfully in the sense of the power of following him. Go forth and be, go forth to follow him with a greater conviction, greater compassion. Put your faith in our hearts, Lord. Thank you for being with us and with us. Please them and 